happened to be in Lima, uh, Peru, in 1968 or so. And uh, uh, it was, I was staying with a colleague who had worked with Pan American, uh, Dr. Malaga, Aurea Malaga. And I said, look, the paper said you got 5,000 cases of brucellosis in the greater Lima area. And he said, where did they get that? And then we searched and we found out by calling all the hospitals the following week, they all had hundreds of cases and it all came about from goat's milk. And they had had a good spring, a good grass, so the nannies had eaten well and had a lot of milk. So the uh, people selling coffee with cream in it was offering that and a sandwich at a very low price. So everybody was enjoying a good uh, food laced with uh, cream or milk from the goats that all had brucellosis and ended up with the biggest human outbreak that ever occurred. And I remember meeting with the state health officer, or the national, and he said, well, he said, we don't have the funds to deal with this. And it staggered me. I, he, he had all these people in the hospital, but he wasn't doing anything about the uh, goat that had the disease and would perpetuate it. And this is the kind of problems that always upset me. Where is your responsibility? How are you gonna deal with this? You're only gonna deal with sick people or are you gonna deal with what makes people sick? Personally, I always had some interest in uh, medicine. My father was a dentist. I had uncles who were dentists or veterinarians. So I heard medical talk from the time I can remember. And the most important thing that I heard in my memory was Spanish influenza or the Spanish flu. And that was 1918 when I was five years old, just five. And I would hear it and say, so-and-so died of the flu. And in memory, I, my father would come home in the evening and say, we're winning the war. We're beating the Germans, Germs and Germans. And the, my young head associate. Then in the morning, I would hear my grandmother telling my mother that the lady down the street or in the movie theater had died of influenza. And I would say, how could that be? Uh, we were beating the germs at night and they were killing people overnight. And naturally I was confused. And, and that kept my interest alive in influenza all through my whole professional career. I graduated high school in 1930. I was 16 years old. But the Great Depression had started and my father had died in 1928. And we had a house 
and there was a little money. And I was hopeful to go to college. Then suddenly the depression started, stock market 1929. That didn't affect us. Then the depression, then the banks, and the banks, when they failed, took our family money with them. And that was the end of my hope of going to college. So I went to work as an insurance man and selling insurance and so on. And I wasn't, it was a difficult time, 1930 to 1936. I would say, and then my mother became acutely ill with ulcers, stomach ulcers. They operated, and the first operation just wasn't done right. Then they were going to make a second operation, a man that we should have never gone to. He wasn't a surgeon. He just wanted to help out. And she died because the operation wasn't done right. Suddenly I was free. I didn't have an obligation to stay home, help my mother or help my younger brother. And my girlfriend, Ina, encouraged me to go to college, and I spoke to my cousin, who was at Michigan State, and he said, well, come up here. You always can find something to do, wash pots and pans, do sweeping, and that's what I did. And I went up there, the, my mother died in July, and uh, I, just walked away from my employment in September, went to college with maybe $60 a check, some paid my tuition and said, well, good things are gonna happen now. First, I registered in forestry. I wanted to protect the green nature, the trees, the environment. And when I found out in forestry, I was learning how to cut up trees and make lumber on them. I, uh, that wasn't. So I talked to my cousin and he said, well, you can be a small town practitioner be the city veterinarian and carry out a role of protecting the public. Well, that suited me fine. So I transferred from being a conservationist to being a veterinarian and was the best move of my life. And then about the second or third year in veterinary medicine, uh, I took bacteriology under a professor who had gone to the 300th anniversary of the Harvard School of Public, uh, of Harvard University, I should say. And he came back and told the class what a great school it was, and that he had met the dean of the public health school and had made it, asked the question, well, are veterinarians allowed to enter the school? And the dean had said, well, we never had one, so why don't we try one? So he came, Dr. Staff said, came back, and told that story. And I approached Dr. Staffset after hearing him, and I said, 
I would be interested in being such a person to go to school and get an MPH. So he said, well, let's see what we can do. And the dean then became the center of the operation in reading the law that people that were working in public health were eligible to get a fellowship to get an MPH degree. So they rigged it up that in my senior year, instead of taking large animal medicine, looking after mainly horses, I would go and work in the state health department as a trainee. And that made me eligible for a fellowship to Harvard or any other school that had offered MPH. So I became the first veterinarian in the United States to be accepted for an advanced degree in public health. I graduated that year, and then I went to the public health service and said, I'm one of your uh, grantees. You got me through uh, advanced training in public health. And they said, oh, good Lord, we should find something for you. And that was my first assignment to do uh, milk and meat and food investigations in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean area. And there I was, 1943 to 1945. And that's where I got the ideas that the Pan American states would had need for veterinarians in public health because they had never thought about it. They had nobody that doing any milk inspection nor any meat inspection. They always let that go to other people. So I said, these are public health operations. And I was able to convince the people in Puerto Rico that they should hire a veterinarian so I could train them. So that was my first trainee. Then why that occurred, naturally people above me were watching what I was doing, and uh, Governor Tugwell of Puerto Rico, an American sent down by Roosevelt during the war, uh, kind of bragged about me and said I was a public health veterinarian. And that made me a little higher than other people, it seemed. He invited me down to his uh, Sunday night uh, gathering, and people would say, oh, that young veterinarian, they say he's a public health specialist. So my reputation was growing. Then, as the war ended, a request came from Pan American, your organization, would I do a survey of Haiti and the Dominican Republic to determine what their post-war needs would be in veterinary public health? And that was the first time that your agency had any idea of a veterinarian doing anything in public health. So I went first to the Dominican Republic and I met a very nice uh, health officer who was trained at Johns Hopkins. He was MD 
entered in peace. And, oh, he was most cooperative. Then the president, uh, what was the president at that time, the dictator, I can't think of his name, but I, I heard El Presidente. <laughs> he heard that a veterinarian in the state, would I look at his horses? Well, I denied it and said, I'm a specialist in public health, not equine medicine. But they said, you are a veterinarian. And they argued, and they came to me. He was the Minister of Health, the well-trained, and he and I got along well. But he had the Minister of Agriculture with him, uh, and they insisted I look at all these old horses. They're all lame, laminitis, uh, tenons full, all the things that happen to old bodies. We would call it rheumatism in a man. We call it tendonitis in a horse. Anyway, I went and saw it. I thought to myself, God, there's not, nothing I really can do here. I, I did, didn't know enough about uh, what they call burning, using a hot iron uh, in operation for roaring. I didn't know anything about it, all these things. And I told the trainer of the horse, and I said, there's nothing I can do here. And so I uh, went back and they, they two men, health officer and the agriculture came to my hotel and said, oh, buy this, buy that. Can we get you some girls? Uh, are you enjoying yourself? And actually I said, no, no, no. I said, I can't do anything. I am not trained and those horses are seven, eight years old. They were past their career as good running horses because that's what the president wanted them for. And so we left at that point. The next morning, my telephone was ringing eight o'clock in the morning and a firm American voice at the other end. Uh, are you James Steele? Are you a representative of the public health? You know that you have insulted El Presidente. I thought to myself, now, what did I do to insult him? Well, anyway, this man at the other end of the telephone was with the United States Embassy. And he was scolding me that if I don't cooperate, he was going to report me back to Washington that I was not fit to represent the United States. So I thought, oh my God, I'm going to lose my career over taking care of an old, some old horses that can't run. So I went back to see the trainer and he said, Oh, don't worry, Doc. We'll use some medicine so they last for a month. You get out of the country as fast as you can. That I did. I went to Haiti, where the reception was entirely different. Nobody was running horses. Nobody knew what a veterinarian was. So that was my first introduction to the Pan American. The war was over, and I was going to find out what was going to happen to me. Was I going to continue to be a uh, 
a specialist in milk sanitation, meat hygiene, and f food general. And I felt I wanted to do more than that. So I went to the old Pan American building, which is now occupied by uh, some American agency on Connecticut Avenue. And I asked to see the person in charge. I didn't know he was a surgeon general, but it turned out he was a retired surgeon general from the United States Public Health Service, a man by the name of Cummin. And he listened to me with great interest. And he said, young man, those are good ideas. I was saying that all the uh, countries that I had, had been to needed a veterinarian who was trained in public health. That was Haiti and Dominican. We, uh, he said, we got two medical officers here that you should meet. So he telephoned and they came up to his office and there I met, one was from Brazil and the other from Mexico. And they were very much interested in what I had to say. And they said, does this mean we can call on you anytime we have a problem? And naturally, I wasn't quite sure how I should answer. And I said, well, I say you can certainly find out if I'm available. Then, come November, and I get a call, and they said, we have an outbreak of an unusual disease in Panama. And they went on and described, the horses are dying, and children are paralyzed. And I said, well, I can look at the horses, but I don't know anything about children being paralyzed. So I turned to one of my medical colleagues, Dr. Whitney, and said to him, can you come to Panama with me to investigate an outbreak affecting horses and children. And so we made arrangements to go. And we get down there, and we're a day late. We miss our connections. But we immediately go to David, David up there near the Costa Rica border, and they get off the plane, take us out, to the farm where the horses are. Horses thrashing around, falling down, lying down, uh, in a stupor. Veterinarians standing around. And I say to myself, this encephalitis. And uh, a group of veterinarians standing around all oh, smile because they had said the same thing too. But here I was supposed to be that expert from the United States. I was no expert. I was just a young man and knew the literature and knew it. Anyway, we posted some of the animals, took out brain tissue, and inoculated mice to confirm it. So we had mice inoculated, and all this was done the same afternoon that we arrived. And at the end of that time, I said, well, to my colleague, uh, Carl Habel, and I said, Carl, it's your turn now. Let's go see those children. So we go to the hospital and see the hospital is filled with children. 
beds are all occupied, mattress on the floor, everything that you, and he picks up an arm of a, a child on a bed, and he releases it and falls right down. And Carl turns to me and said, this is polio. Polio. The children had polio. The horses had encephalitis. I had made the diagnosis or confirmed what the veterinarians knew where the people in the hospital were calling polio something else. Why, I had no idea. But anyway, everybody was jubilant that I could send a message back to Washington. We've seen the cases, they are diagnosed as Eastern encephalitis in the horses and the poliomyelitis in the children. They have no relation to each other. Polio has no animal reservoir. Uh, encephalitis does cause swelling of the brain and can be disruptive and even be fatal. But anyway, that's my cable back to Washington. Mission accomplished. So then we got a day to celebrate Thanksgiving at the same time. So the natives put on a party for us at the bed or around the bed. And they got some turkeys and cooked them and had a big dance and had, had a great time. Uh, all I can remember was the girls were only belly high on me. I'm six foot four and they were probably five foot four. And we had a great time. And we went back to Panama and uh, every time the plane stopped, I would get out and get some uh, milkshake or ice cream. And I was just, you know, starved for milk and ice cream. And time I got to Panama that night, I had a mild stomach upset and it didn't bother me. And the next day it bothered me more. And I had an argument with getting a plane to take us back to the States, Miami or Florida and Washington. And the officer that was built in the airplane, I told him, good Lord, man, don't you realize that the information we have can affect the health of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> anyway, we got our airplane to go back with all the mice. And I think we had like 24, 36 mice that we had inoculated with the horse brain. We didn't do anything with the polio. We did, that was a diagnosis of its own. And as we approached Washington, uh, I was told to notify somebody to meet us at Andrews Airport, the military airport. And he come in with our winter uniforms that we got left in, and it was cold. It was uh, December. And Joe Dean, my executive officer, who had been behind the scenes in promoting my idea, comes running up the steps and said, Jim, we got your cable that you're coming in with sick men and mice. Yeah, I said, I'm the sick man. The mice are back there. 
Anyway, I step out of the plane and there was ambulances lined up for all the sick men that he thought I was bringing. So I practically had an ambulance for every mouse cage. <laughs> and oh, that made a great story. Everybody was saying, oh, that new veterinarian, he really gets things done. When I go in the office the following week or whatever day, uh, everybody, great, great. And then they say, the state health officers, that is a representative of all 50 states, are in town for their annual convention. You can have five minutes to tell them what you're doing because there's 10 or 12 people. And the veterinarian comes last in the alphabet, should I say. So I, I was practically the last speaker. And so I rapidly said, we went to Panama, we found this, found encephalitis in the horse, and, you know, made a few stories on it. And the uh, uh, presiding officer said, oh, go ahead, tell them more, tell them more. So instead of five minutes, I get 25 minutes for telling them this whole story, and they ask questions. And this was my first venture to lay it before all the state health officers, something really new in the public health service. So the following week, everybody was saying nice things about me. And I always look upon that as saying this was the beginning of people recognizing who Jim Steele was, that he was a veterinarian, and he was promoting veterinary public health. The following year, 1947, Dr. Mountain uh, sees me one day and he said, Steele, do you know anything about foot and mouth disease? And I said, well, what I learned in college. Well, he said, they got an outbreak down in Mexico and they say this is affecting their public health. Well. I immediately became cautious because I didn't want to step on the toes of anybody else, F Tosa. And they've been going on for well over a year. And the Mexicans, should I say, doctors or ranchers or the community was saying they were seeing foot and mouth disease in human beings, vesicles on their legs and hands. Well, that made it iffy. The vesicles, you know, little blisters. And Mountain said, well, go down and see what, they, what they're talking about. Because I wasn't committing myself in any way because all I could think of was there had been an outbreak of foot and mouth in the United States in 1914. And many of the veterinarians that had taken part in that and handled infected animals claimed that they had aftosa. And I was reviewing it in my mind. And I said, well, I don't remember what kind of symptoms they were alleged to have. Well, anyway, I get to Mexico and I start asking questions at the embassy, actually. And there is a public health nurse and I ask her, do you know anything? Yeah, she said, 
these people say they're getting blisters. And I said, big ones or what? No, she said, this little pinpoint. Oh. I, then I went to look up my colleagues, a fellow named Chester Mathai. He was setting up the laboratory there, and he had graduated in Michigan State like five years before me. I graduated in 41, he graduated in 35. And I said, with great respect, I said, do you know what this is all about? He, I said, I've been sent down here because people say they're getting a foot and mouth disease and they got vesicles to demonstrate they have it. And he said, I got your answer. We've been investigating that. And what we have is two different diseases, aftosa and vesicular encephalitis. Vesicular encephalitis. A seasonal disease that comes with the spring and new insects and moves gradually in Mexico, from Panama, because later on, the Public Health Service set up a laboratory to investigate its origins in Panama. Chester Mathai then tells me we got two different diseases, but he said, you can't talk about it because I haven't published it yet. So here I am in secret. <laughs> I want to maintain the confidence. So I ask around other people, and other people start saying, oh yes, they found another virus. So that got me off the hook, that I had found other sources of information, that I wasn't violating my confidence with Masai and stealing his reputation. So I carry that information back to Washington. And this one, I say, is the most important one of my career. Because I come back to Washington, I make this announcement to my chiefs, and uh, Dr. Mountain said, this is very important. And Dr. Williams, who's above mountain, said, this is great. You gotta tell Dr. Perrin, the Surgeon General. And Perrin at that time was kind of a God figure because he was the one that opened up syphilis and gonorrhea to treatment. And uh, Dr. Williams said, you gotta go in and tell the Surgeon General this story. So I do. And naturally, I, I'm most overwhelmed being in the presence of uh, Thomas Perrin, who had such a great reputation. And he, he treats me very kindly. Everything goes nicely. And then the next thing I hear from a congressman from Indiana that when I uh, come to a dinner meeting of some congressmen that want to hear the story of what's going on in Mexico. Agriculture had felt if they transferred the idea that I was reporting it back to the United States that they would not be blamed for it. So naturally I accepted, not knowing what the reasons were why they wanted me at a dinner. So at the dinner, I find out that Dr. Perrin is going to be the speaker. And he makes a few remarks and then he says something to the effect there's a young man here that 
was down there to investigate it, and that opens up the door to me because the chair then said, we'll call him Dr. Steele. And so I kind of repeat what I had learned from Chester Mathai. And I would dare say that was the most obvious point of my career. From then on, people said, you know, Perrin asked him to say a word. When Dr. Silver came to office, I immediately made myself available to him so we could sit down and talk about what we could do together. And Silver went so far as to ask me if I could arrange for him to take over the control of foot and mouth of Sosa in Mexico. Well, the, the Department of Agriculture was down there already, and I felt, gosh, this is way out of my province. I, I don't operate at such a high level. But in retrospect, if I had carried that message to agriculture and told them that Sofer would like to take this over uh, under the guise of Pan American, there would have never been this bitterness between Mexico and the United States over resolving the issue, building fences and all. You know, there was just constant feuding back and forth. Sober could have handled it beautifully, and both parties would have been very happy dealing with Pajo instead of Mexico versus the United States. Because here in Texas, they were really tough. Well, Texas ranchers are just, you know, let's get a gun and go down there and shoot it all these cows, or we'll build a fence from the Pacific Ocean to, to the Gulf of Mexico. All kinds of crazy ideas. A bitterness that I certainly want no part of. And there is a book published on all this that is very confidential of all this bitterness that went on. This is why I say Sofer and Bajo would have done a much more sane job and nobody would have been yelling and screaming at each other. This, I would like to say, you can quote me on that because I felt sorry for both sides because Texas ranchers or American ranchers wanted to make damn sure that no cattle could move north of Mexico City or wherever it was. And, well, all I knew it at a distance. I never went back to a second time. I would say this whole affair of Pajo gave me, or uh, F. Sosa, gave me courage to deal with Pajo and the American side on all issues that I knew I could have complete confidence in Pajo of doing the right thing for both parties concerned. Veterinary public health needs the support of the medical profession. And what we call one medicine is very essential for veterinary public health to work. And one medicine means that human medicine accepts veterinary medicine or animal medicine as a partner. They don't have to be equal partners. They never will be because human health and human life 
is much more precious to us than any animal life or any form of life. But we do need that cooperation. And Dr. Rosas, when she was here three or four years ago for the Aftosa meeting for future planning, said that she had more support from the medical profession than she had from the veterinary profession in getting veterinary public health supported. And that's one thing that stays in my mind, that we gotta cater to our medical friends, be they MDs or be they nurses or whatever occupation they have dealing with human medicine, that they understand what veterinary medicine can give to public health.